All right. Uh, thank you, David. Um, there's all kinds of practices, of course, uh, that we do with, with agriculture farming that affect greenhouse gases. In fact, virtually every practice that we, that we have uh, will impact greenhouse gas emissions and also our capacity to adapt to climate change. And I've just listed some of them here to give you some ideas from that perspective. Cropping systems, of course, both tillage and rotation. Um, fertilizer use, particularly as David was mentioning, the nitrogen management. Uh, livestock in terms of ruminants and manure management associated with that. All the organic residues maybe, maybe, that we may be working with um, and amendments to soil. And then our energy use in terms of tillage, irrigation, processing, and transport. Just looking at it from the standpoint of soil carbon, and often we're, we're talking about soil carbon, but just remember that soil organic matter is about 58% carbon. So that kind of puts that into perspective. What we're really talking about is soil organic matter here with respect to carbon. And if you look at the, the history of what agriculture or how agriculture has impacted soil organic matter or carbon, you can take a look at this graph and you can see 100% there um, under native prairie conditions. And typically, as we converted those native lands to agriculture and cultivated them and grew our crops, we've lost around 50% of the organic carbon that used to be in those systems. And this is um, commonly referred to then as kind of our, our um, capacity to build carbon again with our agricultural systems and kind of replace then um, some of the organic matter or restore some of the organic matter back into our soils. And we do that, of course, by taking it out of the, the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide, and through photosynthesis, uh, then that gets returned back into the soil itself. And so if you're looking at um, uh, different kinds of practices then that build organic matter, we're building carbon, we're recapturing it out of the atmosphere. And consequently, that, through that carbon sequestration, uh, reducing the amount of CO2 then in the atmosphere itself. And of course, increasing soil organic matter is, is a, a wonderful thing from the standpoint of agriculture. Uh, there's so many benefits of increasing soil organic matter in terms of, of nutrient supplying capacity as well as water infiltration and our stability of the, of the soil itself to resist erosion and other kinds of, of factors. And in fact, uh, increasing organic matter is, is such a, a, a such a goal from the standpoint of agriculture in general that it and it really buffers our, then our ag systems against stresses, including climate change. Um, when we talk about drought and the impacts of drought that can have on our, on, our, on our cropping systems, our organic systems or systems that have built up organic matter within them uh, can resist some of those, those drought conditions. And here's just a slide from Rodale looking at organic versus conventional system in terms of drought proofing your farm. And, and just by having that organic matter and, and the increased infiltration and the healthier crops that are there that can take nutrients up and water up uh, more efficiently um, is a difference from the standpoint then of how those cropping systems are able to, to uh, resist some of the, the stresses then that uh, climate change might impose upon them. And looking at soil organic matter then and soil carbon in general, it's kind of a, a function then of the different kinds of inputs that we can have in terms of residues and roots and manures and compost. Those then all are, are basically carbon sources then that are, can be put into soil organic matter. And then from the other side of the equation, in terms of losses from soil, we have um, the release of CO2, which is a result of, of just the decomposition of that organic matter by, by microbes that are within the soil itself. And there's a lot of factors then that can impact how much carbon dioxide is, is lost from soil through this decomposition process. In, term, in terms of environment, it's, it's mostly temperature and moisture relations and how that's impacting then the microbes that are there and, and how happy or unhappy they may be. pH affects it, nutrient availability and, and disturbance through tillage, et cetera. Uh, the substrate itself and, and what it's composed of in terms of those additions that we're making, whether it's uh, different kinds of, of, um, of residues and roots can have different chemical makeups in terms of, of lignin and phenolics and other kinds of solubles that can impact then how those microbes can feed on those or not and how easily they are turned over in soil. And then just the physical attributes of the substrate is important in terms of its size and, and again, how susceptible it might be to attack by microbes and use then as a food by the decomposer organisms. 
And looking at crop rotation, this is one of the, the factors, a big factor that we can use through management to influence then the amount and the quality of the organic materials that we're putting back in the soil itself. And there's a difference from the standpoint of the annual versus perennial crops in terms of how much how much uh, crop residues they produce and, and consequently then how much might be returned to soil. And you can see from this little table that's down here, differences between annual versus perennial kinds of crops. And the take home message here is that our perennial crops have much more extensive uh, root systems within them. And the biomass that is associated with that root system can really return quite a bit of, of residue biomass, which translates back into more carbon and more carbon storage within those systems as compared to annual crops. If you look at crop rotation in some of the drier areas, just reducing or replacing fallow uh, is one way then, and replacing that with, with crops is one way to increase the organic inputs uh, into those soils, and that can be very important from the standpoint of, of trying to build carbon within those kinds of, of soil and environments. And of course, legumes can fix nitrogen. This is pretty important from the standpoint of, of impacting then some of the nitrogen cycling that David was mentioning before. But legumes do also tend to to produce less um, uh, organic material, biomass, et cetera, than many of the, the counterparts from the standpoint of non-leguminous crops. Uh, and just a picture from Jerry Glover here, looking at the difference between the perennial wheatgrass on your right there, an annual versus winter wheat. And this is just a graphic that is very eye-opening from the standpoint of, of the amounts of organic matter that are in, in these root systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a, an interesting uh, diagram that shows a tillage and crop rotation interaction. And I'll take a minute to explain what this is. Uh, all the abbreviations are defined below on this. And on your left, you can see this organic carbon. It's just a megagrams of carbon per hectare, uh, ranging from 100 to 180. And then in this particular experiment, we had uh, rotations of continuous soybean versus a corn-soybean rotation versus a continuous corn rotation, and then F understands is, is means fallow, so we had some fallow also in this particular study. And then we were comparing differences with mobile plowing, chisel plowing, and no-till, in other words, increasing uh, amounts of, of tillage and disturbance associated with mobile plowing versus uh, chisel plowing and no-till, more reduced tillage systems. And the take-home message here, if you look at the continuous soybeans, uh, there, you can see in terms of the blue bar and the red bar and the green bar, the different tillage regimes that are there, there really wasn't any significant difference between the amount of soil organic carbon after 14 years in these systems. And that's because the soybeans simply didn't really put in a lot of organic materials in those particular systems. But as we started to increase the amount of, of carbon input through rotation, in other words, corn, soybeans, corn can produce a lot more organic matter, and then continuous corn, which produces um, relatively more so than either corn, soybeans, or continuous soybeans, we could see then the effect of, of tillage became more apparent, reduced tillage in this case. And, and if you got to the continuous corn, then you could see where both the chisel plow and the node till ended up with substantially more carbon in them than the mobile plow system. Livestock, another big consideration, particularly when we start to look at integrated farming systems. And here's just a, a few points to take into consideration when looking at livestock. Enteric fermentation that takes place with ruminants uh, tends to release uh, methane, CH4. And um, some of the research has shown that high energy feeds can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, methane in this case. But that could be countered through longer productive life and some organic systems may more um, uh, basically lactation uh, um, uh, greater numbers of lactations in terms of our of our livestock or lower yields also might uh, be a factor to consider in terms of, of production of methane. Uh, emissions from manure, uh, we tend to minimize some of the methane production if we minimize storage, avoid anaerobic conditions, and we can also couple uh, um, um, uh, manure management with methane digesters that actually capture some of that uh, methane and uses it for energy. Uh, most egg soils are net methane degraders, and uh, methane additions and pasture both can, or manure additions and, and pasture can both increase uh, soil carbon. So just some of the factors with respect to, to livestock production. And then from the standpoint of nitrogen fertilizer, uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is, is synthesized through the Haber-Bosch process. It basically uses methane and combines it with ammonia to, to get um, 
or with nitrogen and two in the atmosphere to uh, uh, create uh, ammonium uh, nitrogen. And uh, so we're using a natural gas feedstock in manufacturing and synthesizing fertilizer, and that also takes energy. Um, a lot of the nitrous oxide emissions from soils occur as the amount of soluble N, N in other words, uh, nitrate and ammonia increase in the soil solution itself. And in fact, if you look overall at the amount of nitrous oxide that's produced, it's about 1%, give or take a little bit, um, of the amount of nitrogen, particularly that supplied via a synthetic fertilizer, 1% of that fertilizer gets converted uh, to nitrous oxide. And you can see on the graph on the left-hand side of your screen, this is just nitrous oxide emissions in kilograms per hectare versus the nitrogen application rate. And you can see as we start to, to apply nitrogen far in excess of what the crop demands are, then that's the, the most hazardous, hazardous condition from the standpoint of, of nitrous oxide emissions. And the, the graph on the right is just, again, reemphasizing some of what David was talking about in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and nitrous oxide in this case. And you can see hours after irrigation and a, and a spike there with the highest nitrogen rate applied. Again, though, a very dynamic system from the standpoint of nitrous oxide production. And if we look at the weighted average winter wheat climb, winter wheat from the standpoint of a life cycle analysis and looking at all the percentages basically of what contributes then to, uh, to greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions, you can see then the, the largest piece of the pie is, is soil nitrous oxide production. And the nitrogen production, you can see the 22% there is as well. So from that standpoint, managing nitrogen it really hits home from the standpoint of its importance in our agricultural systems. And finally, when we start to look at um, mitigation of greenhouse gases, you can kind of look at it from the standpoint of reduce, restore, and replace. Uh, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, in this case nitrous oxide emissions as well as, um, as methane. Uh, much of the uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions can take place if, through agriculture if we're trying to increase the nitrogen use efficiency of the fertilizers that we do, use, that we do use or the manures, et cetera, our sources of nitrogen. If they're used much more efficiently, then we can reduce those emissions. Also, a little bit from the standpoint of, of methane and using the anaerobic digestion. Uh, restoring soil carbon, where we're actually taking atmosphere out, or CO2 out of the atmosphere and we store it in our soils or perennial crops and trees and then just replacing fossil fuels with bio-based energy, chemicals, and materials.